as an entrepreneur transitioning from school directly into entrepreneurship. So welcome, Graham. students because I actually dropped out of a state school myself um, uh, and uh, what I did after that was I went and worked at a bunch of startups that you haven't heard of because they all failed um, and got a lot of experience kind of at the school of hard knocks um, when you're in school it seems like life is planned out for you this is what you do here this is what you do there this is what's happening in the future how your life is going to go. And if you're doing anything entrepreneurial, it doesn't work that way at all. Um, but whatever you've accomplished in the past, whatever qualifications you have, yada, 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 if you're doing your own company, none of those things matter whatsoever. What matters is uh, whether your current venture succeeds. Um, and uh, the things that matter for your current venture succeeding, it sounds like kind of tautological, are its own success. Uh, people's impressions of how great you are, uh, their impressions of how hard you work, all those things really have very little bearing on uh, how well you do. And that's why when people talk about working late nights, it always makes me cringe. I'm really big on not having sleep deprivation, personally. Uh, which is not to say that one shouldn't work a lot, but uh, making sure that you're putting on the show of working constantly and hence not getting enough sleep and hence not being functional, not a good thing to do. It impresses your boss when you have a real job, but when you're working for yourself, really not such a great idea. Um, so my experience uh, creating BitTorrent was, I, I worked at, like I said, a couple of startups you've never heard of. They all went under. Uh, but I had a lot of experience uh, in Networking. <laughs> Turns out layer 5 networking is a very weird, specialized field that nobody knows much of anything about how to work in it. And I'd been doing it for a while. So the last place I was at, I had a bunch... Uh, I'd done some work that I thought was good, and I had a bunch of ideas on how to prove it. I thought everything that I'd done at the last job that was good needed to be totally redone because it had all kinds of problems, but... I thought there was an opportunity somewhere. and. The first thing you always should do when thinking about a business to start is figure out how you're going to create value. Which is, not di which is different from saying, oh, how am I going to create, uh, make a lot of money or anything like that. It's how do I create value? How do I do something that's going to make a material impact in somebody's life for the better? Either like a small impact in a huge number of people or a very big impact for a small number of people. But you should always go, what is this that, this thing that I'm doing? What is it actually going to accomplish? And like I personally could never um, work at a company like, say, Groupon. Uh, maybe I could found a company like Groupon because they had different plans when they started. But something like that, fundamentally, it seems to me, it's, it's a play for making money. It's a ploy. It, it, it might make money, but it doesn't really create value in any way. If it disappeared off the face of the earth, whatever. Not, not going to make a very big difference there. Um, so uh, with BitTorrent, I had these ideas for something that I thought uh, could be good, could really make a difference in the world. And so I uh, started working on it. Now, something that's changed a lot in the Bay Area in the last 10 years is that companies these days are really very product-focused. Uh, back then, there was a lot more technology-focused companies. And I really can't blame people for making the shift. Uh, when I created BitTorrent, what I was trying to do, it wasn't clear that it was possible. It wasn't clear that there was big market pull for it, but mostly nobody had any idea how to do it. And so I lived off of savings for a while, and then credit cards, and <laughs> stuff like that. And after, uh, after two years, uh, it actually started getting significant real-world adoption. And then I did some contract work, yada, 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 and that, then I actually raised some money. And that was this like very long process of really being committed to, I think this can work, 
on paper it looks to me like this really makes sense, so I'm going to stick with it until I get it going. And that required that I have a pretty deep understanding of the technology and a willingness to see it through until it um, bore fruition. And that's not popular to do these days <laughs> because it's very risky, but it's something which I really wish more people would do. How do I make money off of BitTorrent? Oh, uh, well, you take zero and you multiply it by infinity, and it ends up to real money. That's uh, a group model. Yeah, well, I answered this question on Quora, and everyone thought it was hilarious because I answered it. I said, even crappy monetization works when you have more users on Twitter. Because um, we have a lot more users on Twitter, actually. Um, uh, we push out a toolbar right now comes with our client, it's an optional install. Um, and that makes some money for us. It's really not very good monetization. We're working on much better monetization, but that's what we do for now, and we have so many users that we can't stop being profitable. <laughs> Just based off of that. So and trying to scale up to not be quite so profitable anymore hasn't really been based on the user base. Who's your mentor who's your mentor for uh, Laravel Five networking? Oh, geez. Um, and how'd you meet them? Nobody knows much of anything about Layer 5 networking. Um, the closest I could say is Jim Gray, although I never met him. He's unfortunately gone now. Um, but he wrote a book called Transaction Processing. It's this big, thick, black book, which is the really a classic in databases, uh, but it actually teaches you a lot more about databases because it teaches you about um, reliable systems. Reliable systems have a very, very specific meaning in computers, which is that they, not that they have a low failure rate. There are reliable systems that have high failure rates. There are unreliable systems that have low failure rates, uh, although you try to make the reliability help. A reliable system is something that has failed over in it, that something might fail and your system does something about it. And most programmers try and work on these things that just completely breaks their brain. They just can't deal. Like, what, what do you mean I can't call a function and know that it's gonna <laughs> work? Uh, it, it astounds me the way living biological systems work. It, it's all I can do to make just one layer have to have reliability on it. And I do it by making these painstaking state machines, which are extremely hard to debug. Um, uh, uh, but that book kind of explains the basics of how to think about things that might fail and deal with it, and when you're Dealing with layer five networking, everything might fail. Just, just packets go away, peers die, they send weird garbled stuff. It's just horrible. Oh, and you don't know what anyone's throughput rates are, and there's weird latencies, and who knows what's going on. And you just got to deal with it. All right. Oh, yeah. One, yeah, one more question. Yeah, one more question. Um, so, I guess putting myself in your shoes, when you were you're trying to do something that you didn't know. Uh, no, no, I, I did know it could be done, but other people didn't really believe. Me. Oh. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, so I was just thinking, like, maybe I don't know. You said two years in, when you're like living off of credit cards and you said at one point. Yeah. So was there a point where you were thinking, you know, should I keep going or should I just turn around? Uh, no, but I'm told I'm crazy. Um, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. I don't get anxiety the way normal people do. Um, you do or you do not. Get I, I do not get anxiety. It's, it's, What's the? How do you deal with that? I'm told I'm really not missing out on anything. I don't know what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> uh, um, I, uh, you know, I actually, along the way, I was making real progress towards where I was going, and I couldn't really explain it to anyone else very well, what, like what the progress was and why I was doing things the way it was. Like, right now, I've been working on peer-to-peer uh, -peer live streaming for like the last three years. We're actually doing some of the wild deployments of that now. And that's another thing that's an actually even more ambitious project. It's one of these things where, okay, I'm going to go in my cave and work on this for a really long time on this problem which no one else has made any real progress in, and I'm going to do it better than anybody else. Um, uh, I, I, there are specific things you could do here. You can write it into separate modules. That they, you can, 
Well, obviously you can analyze asymptotics about the algorithms as a whole that you're using. Although that's very hard to think about in reliable systems, you can cut it up into separate modules that you can test individually. You can start doing deployments. Uh, for the thing I've been working on for the last couple of years, I actually have an emulator, which does a reasonable job of emulating the way the real internet works. And so I can run my entire system in there. I can like spin up 100 peers under conditions that I'm able to specify very, very precisely, and then just run it and see how it goes. And if there's a problem, if there appears to be a bug, even if the effects of the bug are emergent, I have it set up so that I can literally run the exact same trial again with no real time delay. So it runs it, you know, running 100 peers runs it about real time. So, so an individual peer would take 1% CPU if, if it was running and then I can add diagnostics and stuff to it. So, so there are ways you can kind of get a better handle on what you're doing. Like if I didn't have good test setups and ways of studying what I'm doing, I'd have failed miserably <laughs> um, by now. Uh, but mostly it's kind of the engineer's approach to the world, right? Where you know you look at a uh, you look at a power plant and most people see just the shapes of the buildings and stuff. And that's not really very enlightening when you're trying to think about how a power plant works. A power plant is really uh, based on thermodynamic cycles. If you don't know anything about thermodynamic cycles, you're never going to understand much of anything useful about what a power plant is doing. Uh, and that's kind of how you have to think about things. If you're going to go, well, I think this is going to work. It works on paper, therefore. Uh, hashing out the details is just a matter of logistics, and that's doable. All right, thanks, Graham. All right, Graham. And next up we have Jessica Alter, who started formative lab.